Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And I'm Jeff. And we are going to answer your questions. But first, Jeff, Hmm? love is in the air. (laughs) It is, as of this recording, it is the day before Valentine's Day, 2017. (laughs) How are you doing today? Oh, pretty good. Uh, Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Cool. Cool. (laughs) Um, got anything special planned for Valentine's Day? Um, no, nothing too crazy. Just, yeah. uh, just, just a nice little day out. There you go. That's fine. Um, my wife and I, we like to, we, we haven't actually done anything. Like we haven't gone out to eat on Valentine's Day in a long time because no. it's super busy. Yeah. The yeah. service isn't going to be as good because there's so many people there. Right. In some cases it's more expensive. Well, yeah, that's true. They sometimes will hike up prices. Yeah. And so, like that. so we were gonna... I was going to make dinner for, for my wife on the the Sunday, right before the Sunday before Valentine's Day. And then I ended up having to work that day. So oh, right. we're kind of, and she works on Valentine's Day. I don't, but she does. So I'm going to try to have something made for her when she gets home. We might end up doing something next Sunday. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, no, we're going to, we're going to go, <laughs> we're basically going to go grocery shopping. <laughs> there you go. Which I mean, like, yeah, like it's, it's. Going out to dinner on Valentine's Day can be just a mess, and it's just sometimes just not worth it because it's a lot of stress, and that's not what you want on a day yeah. like that. Um, so no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take it easy, and then I'll, I'll probably make her dinner or something later in the week. So there you go, be good. All right. Well, before we get into questions, uh-huh. we're gonna take a small detour Uh-oh. into a place that we like to call oh geez the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> So the item that we have today was submitted by Chris via Facebook. Good friend of mine, Chris. Mm. Uh, I've talked about him on previous episodes. I'll talk talk about him on other episodes too. But uh, he submitted this item. It's a fairly simple one, but I think it's it's, uh, got some potential. It is called Stonecutter. This is a sword that appears to be constructed of granite, but is much lighter. It has dwarven runes that are as ancient as they are indecipherable along the flat of the blade. It's a short sword, actually, and it has the ability to cut through stone as easily as it cuts through flesh. Mm. Other than that, has no bonuses, no magical effects. It just has the, the stats of a short sword? Stats of a short sword. Stats of a non-magical short sword, except huh. it can cut through stone as if it were flesh. I think this is kind of a, a neat concept. It's a very subtle thing, yeah. but there's a lot you could do with that. You know, you could carve some stuff into walls you could uh you could use it to to make art you right. could you know when you're on the road you could grab a rock and you know whittle it down into something else and make you really really intricate uh stone sculptures right or some good old-fashioned heroic vandalism <laughs> yes <laughs> there you go that's that yeah that, that that's a really cool item i think because it's because it's just a regular sword otherwise like it's something that can be given to a player early on and it's like it's a neat really neat thing that they can use and depending on how they use them it's not too powerful or anything like that yeah people can get really creative with it i assume and find some ridiculous ways to to cheese it out but but i mean if for the most part it's just like it's a really neat thing that you can give an adventurer to make it feel like oh wow this is treasure like this is awesome this is a cool thing i just got so like i don't know i really like that it's just a normal sword otherwise and it just but it can just it can cut through stone really yeah. really well um cutting through solid objects is 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 was kind of a side effect of having an admantine weapon in mm-hmm. 3.5 admantine had a hardness of 20 so anything that had a hardness of 20 or less you could just ignore its hardness. And that was that was pretty cool. Like like this, you could use it to cut through stone or even steel as if it was a flesh. Right. I think this is neat because it is not nearly as powerful as Admantine, but still has a little bit of that like this is this is a, a powerful weapon in the yeah. right circumstances. Similarly, I remember when I ran the Age of Worms campaign, I mentioned in a previous episode, the first adventure of the Whispering Cairn mm-hmm. is really good. One issue that I did have with it was it was a first level adventure that gave the players a plus one weapon like right near the beginning. And I understand why, because there is a monster that you encounter in that adventure near the end. You encounter a Grick. A Mm. Grick, it's like this big snake thing with four tentacles or something. But its main thing is that it, it has damage reduction that can only be overcome by a magic weapon. 
and that could be a very deadly encounter for a party that doesn't have a dead, doesn't have a, a magic weapon and this is a first level adventure so they probably won't so i can understand why the adventure then put one it was like a dagger or something they put one magic item somewhere one magic weapon somewhere else in the adventure mm-hmm. so then if you search every nook and cranny you'll find it and then it's like you found the key for that later adventure yeah. i liked that aspect i didn't like the idea Of you guys actually having a plus one weapon that early in the game. So what I did was I gave you guys, it was, it was a dagger that just overcame damage reduction as if it was magic. Hmm. Didn't have any bonuses to hit. If you wanted to enchant it further, you had to treat it like it was just a base, a base dagger. But I gave it that little bit of extra effect that a magic wa- magic weapon would have had, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to give you the actual power of a magic weapon. So in a similar way, if you want to give if you wanted to give your players a weapon that could cut through solid objects like stone, but you don't want them to have all that extra stuff that you know all right. the, the normal stuff that comes from having something like adamantine, you could give them this. Yeah, it's like yeah, less me- less mechanical or combat mechanical like yeah. benefit, and more just kind of a cool. Really cool thing, actually. I also like how I like the the flavor of it. It's made of stone. Like yeah, it's, it's a short sword that's made of stone. I think that's yeah. really cool. It's made like made by dwarves or something like that. That's really neat. Um, I also really like how it has dwarven runes on it mm-hmm. that it just says in the description are indecipherable. Mm-hmm. And I I think there's something really cool about having ancient writing on an item that the players have that they do not, at least at the beginning of the campaign, that they do not have a way to right. to decipher. Yeah, because you've talked about ways to, like, put in little adventure hooks, and yeah. one of them could be, like, oh, that, you know that sword you've carried around for seven levels? Like, yeah, you you can now read that, actually, now, because you have this spell or whatever, or this guy who's like, oh, yeah, I recognize that writing, and yeah, it could be like, oh, that's that's the writing of so-and-so he's actually in town today or something you know <laughs> there you go or maybe maybe you uh eventually are able to read it and maybe it's a command word for some other ability that the that the short sword has or right it is a command word for a matching item Ooh. the players can find later uh-huh. so yeah i think there's a lot a lot of potential role-playing wise for yeah. this and i think it's just a really cool you know unique item and i think it would be neat if you find out that this dag, this uh, short sword, originally belonged to some guy that was like renowned for killing stone golems or right. something, because you like know that. if if it could overcome the resistance of a stone golem or <laughs> something, I just uh, I can just I don't know I just always imagine giving this to players and like just like for the first hour they're like all right let's see what else I can cut with this thing like. <laughs> It's like, uh, uh, what about these stone pillars? It's like, probably not a good idea. It's going to, the ceilings might come down. Oh, whatever. <laughs> you know, or they're just like, you know, like, I like just, hurt, you know, vandalism, basically. It's just like, I'm just going to cut, I'm just going to drag the sword along the wall the whole time we're in this dungeon. Yeah. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> it's just a big gash in the wall now. And so like, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cool item. I like, it. I like anything that doesn't necessarily give you a huge bonus to your combat abilities but just kind of gives you a little just something else you can do something else that's in your tool in your, your character's toolkit you yeah. know so i like i like it a lot yeah yeah i think it's pretty cool all right do you want to go ahead and get into questions um sure yeah let's go for it all right our first question comes from bang on uh, reddit uh what tips and tricks do you have for dming and in one-on-one campaign all right so one big thing that you want to keep in mind when you play a game of D&D with, with a large amount of players or a small amount of players, mm-hmm. is that action economy is a huge, huge factor in D&D. When it comes to combat, because when you're, when you're doing like a one-on-one campaign, that's going to be a big concern is combat. Mm-hmm. You could just not have very much combat if you wanted to, but then you'll run into other problems, which I'll get to in a little bit. But um, when you do use combat, a typical monster in D&D is assumed to be a challenge for X level. But when they say, you know, like, let's say it's a level four monster. A level four monster is kind of expected to be fought by an entire group of level four players. Right. So when you have four or five players, I think fifth edition D&D, I think the the expectation is five players. Hmm. Other editions, it was four or whatever. But when the game expects you to have four or five players... That means they expect you to have four or five sets of actions. So a single player up against a creature of even a couple levels below them Mm -hmm. 
is going to have a much, much harder time than an entire party would. Right. This gets so much worse when you put in additional enemies. You could have a 10th level character that is up against a whole bunch of like, I don't know, first level goblins. And it very well could go against the much, much higher level player just because there's so many fewer actions. Right. If he takes some damage and he needs to heal himself, well, you know, I guess he can, but that's going to cut into his actions. Right. And it's going to, it's he's got to wait 10 rounds or 10, you know, 10 other uh, monsters actions exactly. before he can do that. So like that, that is going to be a big concern. You can, like I said, just have uh, fewer encounters. Mm-hmm. You could have, you know, only put in one or two enemies at a time. You know, there's, there's some ways to get around that, but it's just something to keep in mind. Because a lot of people might not think of that. They might think, oh, well, you know, he's third level. I can I can throw a couple second level monsters at him. Mm-hmm. And not necessarily because those second level monsters are expecting an entire rounds, you know, entire party's worth of actions coming back at them. Yeah. If, if they have like stuns or slows or just a oh, like whole person yeah. sort of thing, you're just, you're done at that point. Yeah. Like it, yeah. But it, it's, it's screwy because that kind of takes away some of the 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 fun of it because like it's cool to fight a dragon because dragons are really neat but dragons also have like several attacks in one round yeah and if you're have a dragon up against a player who's got one attack even if that player's really really high level yeah that's that's not going to go as well as you think um fifth edition i was just watching a video recently where a guy was talking all about like the you know the mechanics of fifth edition and the design choices and so on and in fifth edition especially Actions are a huge, huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Like you have a much lower attack bonus and as a result, AC is a lot lower, but the, the, the end result is that a, a good or a bad role can, is, is a huge deal. Yeah. So whichever side has more actions, whichever side has more potential to make roles, to make good or bad roles, whichever side has more actions is going to, is going to, to end up better off in the end. Yeah. So, like, with 5th edition especially, the game is expecting you to have a whole bunch of actions. Now, there's a few ways to get around this. One possible way is to, um, I would recommend letting the player have multiple characters. Maybe you give him a, a character that um, doesn't talk very much, so like he only has one role-playing character to think about. Mm-hmm. But you could give him another character that he has to control in combat so that he he has additional actions. Mm-hmm. And then also he has a different uh, different variety of abilities too. So like he could play a fighter and he could have his his sidekick be a cleric so that he could fight and not have to worry about, oh, well, where's my healing going to come from? He knows because his healing's right there. Yeah. An issue that I've, uh, I'm sure eventually we'll really delve into on this podcast is DM PCs. That is when a, a DM has a player that is part of the, has a, a character that is part of the group. Mm-hmm. As a general rule, I would say never use DMPCs for reasons that we'll get to if and when we get to that that yeah. topic. But if there was ever a time to do it, it would be in a one-on-one campaign. That being said, I, I do think it is better to, if you're going to put in an additional character, give that character to the player so that the player is doing as many things as he can. Because the DM already is going to have a lot of stuff that he's got to do. Yeah. Let, let's for him to focus on you yeah know, not don't need to give the dm more work to do plus i mean like you want to we want the player to feel like he's doing something yeah you know? like you don't want him to feel left out on you know f- you know three-fourths of the of the battle because there's you know he's up against so much yeah i have i have some thoughts i have some thoughts against against giving them another character okay because there, there is something there is something about the the player character relationship that's kind of important so when you're giving a when you're giving a player multiple characters to deal with it kind of uh, i don't know it kind of like waters it down a bit i guess okay i could see that um but then again like you know you you if it's from the beginning like okay you're gonna have two characters that can find a really cool story to to you know to put together for why these characters are together yeah and i can't remember if I had come up with a neat reason for it, but I did, there was a campaign where I were, I was playing two characters. Actually, there was a couple, there was a couple of times I was playing two characters. There was a campaign that we did where Jay was running. Uh-huh. It was the red hand of doom in 3.5. Yes. And it was, it was just you and me as the players and Jay. And then each of us had two characters. Had two characters. Okay. 
uh, which is kind of what I'm using as my inspiration for this. I've never personally run or played in a one-on-one campaign, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, just kind of general tips. I, I think it, it's, I'm sure people do it, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, just some things you got to be aware of. Yeah. But yeah, I just, yeah, I do remember having a couple characters and I had a pretty good time with it. Cause the, the first time was, um, I just, my character had the leadership feat, which allowed him to, yes. like, I, I want to say, yeah, it was, it was just, yeah, it was a feat that allowed you to, t- to pick up a, a cohort and yeah. who was like a, like a level or two behind you. I think he was always two levels below you. Yeah. Which, you know, like he, he turned out fairly useful. Like I was, uh, I think we just like, I, I made him a cleric cause we needed a healer or something like that. <laughs> right. And I was like, okay, that'd be, that'd be nice to have. And and like, I, I don't know. I, I, Gave him a prestige class at some point, and like, uh, you know, I think we had a pretty good time with him. And but like, uh, you know, I think in the in those in, in those days, I think we just had him go uh, like had us go on the same initiative or something like that, just to keep Probably. things, uh, just to keep things less confusing. So I don't I don't have to remember like so. There's just one round where I'm doing something, so I don't have to like keep track of like okay, when's when's this guy coming up next? Okay, now I'm, like having yeah. twice as many rounds as the twice as many like actions can get kind of uh daunting on the player but again those those were both in cases where you know we're playing it's it wasn't just a one-on-one there was at least one other one other player yeah yeah i don't, I don't know like yeah doing a one-on-one would be tricky like steve and i did it a little bit but that was way early on when we were just when he was like just introducing me to the game yeah uh, and so you don't have to give additional characters mm-hmm. but if you don't, you're just you're gonna have to kind of completely overhaul how you do combat, right? Just because you know how combat works, you need additional actions. Now, one one thing that has been in a couple editions that uh, was I think was kind of meant for this is the idea of gestalt characters, mm. gestalt or gestalt or how yeah. do you pronounce it? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, the idea of that is that you have one character that has two classes, mm-hmm. so you choose two classes and you get all of the abilities of both classes. And then, like, if it comes down to something like what hit die do you roll, you use whichever, the higher of the two. Right, yeah. But the idea for that, like, you you are undoubtedly more powerful than a single class character would be. This is not meant to be balanced. Mm-hmm. But it's for small groups where you may not have all of the resources you would have otherwise. For example, if you don't have a healer, you know, you could make your character a fighter that is also a cleric. Right. Um... But that still doesn't solve the problem of action economy. Right, because you're still one character. You don't, exactly. You don't get two attacks because you're two classes. You're just, right. You still, you still have the one attack bonus and the one attack. Yeah, so um, so just all kind of it, – it solves part of the problem but doesn't solve all of the problem. You would right. still need to pretty heavily change how you deal with combat. Uh, so there's – you know, the, there's that. There's also the issue of outside of combat. Um, you know, when you're just doing role playing or ex- exploration or whatever, you got to keep in mind that instead of five people at the table all trying to do their own thing and all trying to talk, whatever, you've only got two people at the table. Yeah. So both people, the DM and the player, are both going to have to pick up the slack. Right. Um, They're you know, be putting in more work because there's less people to spread the work around. Yeah, or... yeah. So like, you know, the DM is probably already going to be doing a lot of talking because it's he's the NPCs and he's kind of he's speaking for the environment. The player is also going to have to be a lot more creative in in what he does and what he says and so on. So like, you know, if you the DM says to the players, "Okay, you enter, you enter a room and there's there's two doors, there's a waterfall coming in from somewhere." If there's an entire group of players, you know, they're all going to be like, oh, well, I have this idea and then I have this idea and so mm-hmm. on. That one player is going to have to come up with all of the ideas. Right. So it's it's going to be more work for everybody involved, especially for that one player, even outside of combat. So, you know, just something to keep in mind if, if you do want to do this. Yeah. Like I said, I personally haven't done this. I do have a, a friend, a good friend of ours, Jay. Did if I'm not mistaken, did run a one-on-one campaign in Pathfinder, I think, uh, but uh, I wasn't able to get a hold of him, so otherwise would have gotten some specific advice. Yeah, you did have something in the Age of Worms, I think, where you well, like d- sort of like did a couple little individual things. Yeah, I'll I'll do like adventure. I'll do like a little mini adventure for yeah. somebody, um, but a whole you know I think that's a little different than a whole campaign. True. Yeah. Absolutely. And and with those, I think for the most part, it, there wasn't really much combat. It was pretty much just like. Okay, here's a little fetch quest you have to go on and, mm-hmm. and so on. And in those, I then had to 
come up with more interesting NPCs so that there would be, you know, there'd be something for the player to go off of and, right. you know, so that it wouldn't, wouldn't reach a lull. Actually, speaking of just stalt there, um, there's a, there's a race. I think it, I think it was from, uh, the dragon compendium. Or okay. So, so it was in, in the dragon magazines. Um, it was a, it was a race, uh, that probably had a level adjustment, but I'm pretty sure it was two people. Yeah. Like they were, they were linked together. There was it was a race that was basically always born as twins. And so it was twins, like one soul split between the two of them, right? And if one died, the other one would basically commit suicide with it. You know, tr- try its hardest to commit suicide within you know a certain amount of time or something like that. And yeah. Like, but like, I just thought it'd be interesting to have a gestalt character who was also two people, just so you can kind of like. <laughs> so it's like technically you're only one character because it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a char- it's a single player character race that is two things and yeah like they get like flanking they have like get like a plus three to flanking rather than a plus two or something like that right right so that'd be kind of interesting that's a neat idea maybe even like something to do with the camp something in the campaign could be like your soul is split into two and like you have mm. two people and like but like you know if either one of you dies they both die or you know something like that yeah so like that could be part that could be like the main hook of the of the um of the of the campaign is you trying to get your you know your soul put back together again or something yeah and maybe it gets split a third time oh somewhere down the, lo- re- the the road when like you know like things are getting trickier so you need more people and like each time your soul gets split <laughs> like you you know pick a new class or something like yeah. that it'd be like a neat little i don't know you could uh end up like that episode of rick and morty where the <laughs> time ends up getting split until there's like Oh, right. 128 different versions of them all doing the same thing <laughs> in different timelines. Oh goodness. Okay. Um I I, th- I think we pretty much pretty much answered yeah, that. Yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah, um, but uh I don't know. Like I I'm sure that if you were to just try it, you would learn a lot from doing it. Right. Um so the next question uh comes from from uh, Lazoth at uh Reddit. As players reach higher levels, how do you balance combat while keeping it interesting but not too deadly? So the main thing here is you're going to want to try to incorporate each player's strengths and weaknesses as much as possible. You want to involve everybody. Uh, Because of how high level play is, because there's so much that can happen, the stuff, the options you have at high levels are so powerful and there's just so many options. Mm -hmm. High level encounters kind of all have to be specifically built around your players as much as possible. If you don't, the encounters are either going to end up too easy and therefore not interesting or too deadly. So, you know, like I said, really try to incorporate each player's strengths and weaknesses. One idea that I have is, uh, this is really good for any level, but I think it kind of gets uh, gets exacerbated at higher levels because, like I said, there's so much going on. Try to have your combats involve some other goal mm-hmm. beyond just defeating your opponent. Yeah. Uh, whenever I play a, a, like a video game RPG, like a Final Fantasy game, there's always encounters where there's always boss fights where I'm purposely trying not to kill the boss. Yeah. Because they have an item I want to steal or they have, uh, you know, a blue magic spell that I need them to cast on me <laughs> right, or whatever. Right. And so an, an encounter that otherwise would have been a really boring, okay, I just use my highest level attacks on him, he's dead. Instead becomes, okay, how do I incapacitate him as much as possible and buff myself as much as possible without actually killing him and making it as easy as possible for my thief to steal yeah. or so on. So if you can take that idea and incorporate it into D&D, really any level can benefit from this, but higher levels especially. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, you're trying to steal something from the bad guy, maybe the bad guy is literally immortal, like literally unkillable, but there's something that the players can do by manipulating their environment or combining some magic items or something to incapacitate him. Right. Or something. Or maybe, like, you can kill him, but he'll come back. Mm -hmm. Or they have to wait a certain amount of time before they can get away or before the encounter is over or something, yeah. something, some, some other objective that they can, that they can be working on in the middle of battle, which, you know, is just doing anything other than just fighting in battle can always be tricky. Cause you're one, you're in rounds and things go a little bit slower. So like trying to like manipulate devices or if you're trying to, if you're trying to like disarm a trap in the middle of battle, you're going to be there for a couple rounds. Yeah. 
or you know protecting somebody like a like a or like doing like an escort quest sort of thing where you like you have to defend somebody which can be tricky and so like you know it like you're not necessarily fighting um a really difficult enemy but there might just be a lot of enemies and you're you're trying to make sure that this one person stays safe yeah which you know like if you're a really powerful high level character it won't be too hard but like the the dm could like if the dm feels like they're getting away with it a little too easy throw an extra couple monsters in there and like you know they'll have to use their actions wisely because like okay if i if i go over here if i go too far in this direction it's going to take me an, an extra turn to get back to you know to the person i'm defending if something happens yeah so like things like that can be to make things trickier without necessarily making them deadlier like I mean, we're like worst case scenario, everybody dies, but like <laughs> that but, is a pretty bad but scenario. I mean, like, but above that is the person you're defending dies, right? And like, okay, there's ways to like you know there might be you know some uh, some repercussions for that in the in the campaign, or you know they might be like you know what we can go get our uh, you know true res or something later on, but it's still like a, like oh we got defeated you know but we didn't necessarily die, yeah. I think that's um, – you actually made me think of a good point. If you can make it so that the consequences for failure is not the campaign's over, Mm -hmm. if you can make it so the consequences for failure are something other than just your character dies, that will make your encounters so much much more more fun, I would say, because the players are going to be willing to do more stuff they wouldn't have done otherwise and – Achievements. (laughs) <laughs> achievements achievements like uh, people 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 make fun of achievements in video games all the time it's like what are they for well they're, they're things that you do like okay you get achievement points or whatever in, in like xbox it's like what are the achievements points for they you know they're just points that show that you've done you've done more than just play the game you've you've gone and done every challenge that the game developers have put in front of you so like there's so like a boss battle in a video game where there's an achievement where like if you take no hits, you know that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, so the failure, like the failure of not getting that achievement, doesn't stop the game. It just, you know, you you still have that f- sort of that like that feeling of oh crap, I didn't, ah, I didn't get that thing I needed. But but hey, you know, I can either try again in some cases, or I can just move on and try to do something else that's cool. So I, I feel like some sort of, not necessarily an achievement system, but at least keeping things like that in mind when yeah. coming up with a, with an encounter for high level characters is like, okay, what are some like what are like obviously they could just go in guns blazing, take out the bad guy, right? But there's several hostages around, and if you get all the hostages, like you get a big reward, or if like you know if you manage to you know find you know you know find the the treasure or something like that, just like. Extra things that can make make it a higher risk but a higher reward. So you're you're risking, you know, you're risking the the your your characters' lives by trying to get these extra things, but you're getting more reward out of it. So I mean, it'd be it'd be kind of a way to kind of like set the let the players set their own difficulty too, actually. Yeah, because it's like if you can, you know, if you can goad the goad the players into into doing it, that'd be good because like you know, it's like all right. Like, yeah, you guys are really powerful, but, you know, do you want to really test that out? Like, you know, like, yes, you could just go in there and dis- use the rate of disintegrate. I know that. But we'll look, look at this cool, enticing thing. Like, maybe you can, you know, maybe you can try that. Yeah, I, I guess just any time the, the battle is no longer about, okay, let's just go and kill everything. I think it becomes just inherently more interesting. Yeah. Um, this is uh, not at all a standard case, but when we were doing Age of Worms, there was an encounter near the end of the campaign. Where the players were fighting this this Dracolich. In fact, if I'm not mm. mistaken, it was canonically supposed to be the first Dracolich ever. Oh yeah, I do remember this. And so it was supposed to be this really, really big, powerful encounter, really difficult, all sorts of extra bad guys. And I was trying to run it as written, as it was written in the in the magazine, just despite the fact that we had done we had made some house rules and as a result you guys were actually pretty powerful. Yeah, for especially sure. Especially Steven's character who was <laughs> like at this point he was like a 17th level cleric, first level barbarian <laughs> just because he was a demigod. Pretty much just <laughs> because clerics campaign. were so so powerful with all their buffs. And so he said to me before the encounter he was like, "Okay, Gabe, I am not going to attack 
the dragon. <laughs> because if I do, it's going to be over too fast. <laughs> and I mean, I knew this. He knew this. All right. If, I could have like done a lot of work to make the bad guy, you know, the, the dragon even even tougher. I could have. Maybe it would have made it more interesting. Maybe not. But I think the player's decision to instead focus on killing the ads, focus on killing all of the minions that were around. You know, he was killing two or three of them per attack. Right. No question. He was at this point. I think he was literally doing over a hundred d six worth of damage <laughs> because he was. Like he colossal re- size. Oh, right. Using oh, a, God, uh, he was. you know, a, a great axe that was colossal size and he had all these oh, whatever. So he was doing, he had, you know, over like six hits or whatever he was doing. He, he did so many D6 worth of damage that he asked if he could roll D100s instead. Like, <laughs> like one D100 and whatever. And I said, yeah, go for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot he had like... He was able to, yeah, use like the large person up to a colossal He, he did size. Righteous Might, which uh, uh, righteous was, might. you know, increases you like two size categories or something. And then there was also, he used Miracle to replicate a Wu Jen spell that did something similar. Oh my goodness. So he was, he went from being a, sm- he was a gnome. He went from being small sized <laughs> to being colossal <laughs> sized. And to be fair, he was using multiple high level spells in order to do this. Right, from several different books. I, right, I forgot right. about the Wu Jen spell. Yeah, yeah, Wu Jen's pretty awesome. And so anyway, because he knew that the battle would not be interesting if he attacked the dragon, <laughs> he was like, I'm gonna do something else. And that way it made it made the encounter more interesting. Yeah. Definitely. I, I do remember the encounter. Like it was a it was a fun time. Yeah. Now I don't expect all players to say, hey, I'm going to voluntarily make myself less powerful right you know i again i don't expect that but when you do something that gives a player a different goal than just deal as much damage in as small amount of time as possible then it inherently will make the battle more engaging Mm -hmm. so yeah if you can find some way to make combat more involved than just fighting it could even be just like the 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 monster can only be killed with a specific weapon the weapon can only be wielded by a specific player so that that so you're basically you're you're making it much more difficult to fight and kill this this boss but you're 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 kind of forcing the other players that aren't using that weapon to be doing something else yeah so you can you know it's like okay so there's there's plenty of ads so you have to keep the ads off of the person who's doing the attacking or something right. like that so yeah kind of i don't know orchestrating more what the what the players are doing to make the the battle more difficult, I guess. Yeah. Or more challenging. There's a, I'm reading a book. Um, there's an old computer game that I used to have. It was a D&D computer game called Curse of the Azure Bonds. Okay. It was the sequel to Pool of Radiance, which was like a really popular computer game back in like the Commodore 64 era. And uh, anyway, so this, this game, I guess, was based on a book. Either that or the book was based on the game or something. But I'm reading this book. It's called Azure Bonds. And there's a, there's a point in the story where uh, the adventuring party... They're spending the night in this, like, burnt-down inn that they come across on their travels. And one of the characters has, like, a dream where she's in the the inn before it was destroyed. And this, like, monster appears and starts attacking people. At one point, it, like, eats this barbarian and, like, spits out his sword. And then in her dream, she's told what that thing is. It's, like, this weird floating, like, ghost thing or whatever. And this guy in the dream tells her... Its weakness is that it can't eat anything twice. And so when she wakes up and the party actually gets attacked by this weird ghost thing, they have to search through the rubble to find the sword that was spit out by the monster. Uh Uh-huh. Because apparently they later explain that, like, the acids in its stomach or something like that coat anything that it can't... It can't digest metal. And so it spit out the metal. And because the acid in its stomach affected the metal in some way, that made the sword the only thing that could damage it. So anyway, they had to like search for the sword and then get the sword to a character that could wield it. And then that character then had to, to kill it. And so I, you know, just, it's, it's a neat thing. Like you were saying, if it can't be killed except by a certain thing. Yeah. That brings, yeah, that brings a lot more challenges to the, to the battle. Yeah. So, I mean, these kind of apply to any level, just they become more important at high level because high level is just such a crazy grab bag of everything. Yeah, especially if you have like a spell if you have spellcasters involved and yeah. so there's, just, there's so many there's so many ways to get around things right. with spells and at high levels. 
Yeah, so just know what your know what your players can do and can't do and take that into consideration. All right. Next question comes from uh, Nicholas P. And this is through email. Which do you think is better, a campaign with a single overarching quest or a campaign that is more like an anthology of different quests? So when you have one overarching plot, the advantage is that the players will most likely feel invested from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Once they get involved at the beginning, they probably want to see that through till the end. They probably want to see, okay, how does this lead directly into this and this leads directly into this? And they can see how their progress is affecting the campaign. One disadvantage, though, is that the players might not, they might not like it. Maybe eventually they get bored of this plot line. And at that point, you're kind of, kind of stuck. Yeah. You can't, you don't really have the freedom to do whatever you want. Um, now, I don't think many players would just tell the DM, oh, no, we don't want to do this anymore. But I mean, one of the advantages of doing a uh, an episodic campaign that's an anthology of different quests is that after one adventure, you can do whatever you want. You could come up with a follow-up for that adventure. Mm-hmm. You could do something completely different. And so the the advantage of, of one is kind of the, the disadvantage of the other. So um, if you do like an episodic one, mm-hmm. like I said, there's that, that freedom to do whatever you want. However, the downside is the players might not feel like what they're doing really is making a big difference. Right. They might not be as focused. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another disadvantage of doing a uh, an overarching quest is that it's hard not to railroad players. Right. And they might feel like they're being railroaded. Yeah. Don't, you don't want to... You don't want to feel like you're stuck on a path and you have really have no choice in a game that's all about choices, really. Yeah. Like it's, you know, it's a choose your own adventure to a crazy level. Right. It's it's kind of sucks when it's brought down to, all right, you have to go and do this now. Yeah. Like, and also a lot of like overarching plots in some way involve like a time time limit. Right. The the world's going to be destroyed in X number of days. Sort yeah. Of thing. There's, there's always a point in those kinds of, of campaigns where like, well, we have to keep going. We, we can't take time off. We can't go do something else. Right. And so that, that, that can be kind of crummy as a player. I mean, going, going to, going back to comparing it to a television show, the, the one, the, the one thing that came to mind, Star Trek, yeah, Star Trek's really good uh, with the Monster of the Week sort of thing. The Next Generation is the one I'm thinking of specifically. Right, right, <laughs> of course. Voyager. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry for anybody who doesn't like Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> my uh, my fiance watches it a lot. Um, Voyager has more kind of like a mix. It is very it's episodic, but there is still an overarching plot to it. I mean, there is there is some overarching plot in in Next Generations uh, a little bit with like the the Borg and everything. Yeah. To a much greater degree in Voyager, there is a Borg overarching plot. As, I mean, but obviously, like, they're, you know, the whole point of the show is they're trying to get back home. They're stranded out in a different section of the galaxy trying to get back home. And, like, and like there is some episodic thing to it because it's, like, sort of like, okay, what do they encounter this, you know, this week? And it might have nothing to do with them getting home. It's just an interesting phenomenon that they come across. Yeah. But for the most part, most of the episodes are like, okay, here's this thing that maybe we can use to get back home. Or like they find some race that wants to like help them out, but really they're just trying to trick them or something or yeah. that sort of thing. So in some way, they're, each episode has to do with get them getting back home. So it's a lot, a lot more a lot more of an overarching thing. Trying to blend those two things together can be tricky because then you end up with filler episodes that nobody gives a crap about. Yeah. And it like some filler episodes can be neat. And like some like, you know, some side quests can be great. Like it'd be like, oh, like, oh remember that one time we went and, you know, uh, t- turned that tavern into a floating island. Or, or, I don't know. <laughs> sure. Like, just, like it had nothing to do with anything, but it was neat. It was cool. Like we did that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there is going to be times where it's like, why are we doing this? Why aren't we over? Why aren't we fighting the lich guy that's been terrorizing us for years? Like, how come we're not doing that right now? Like, you know, why, why? why are we bothering to to do this side quest or yeah so it can be i don't know i just i, I can just always remember watching shows as a kid and being like this is like hating filler episodes it's like i want to get to the cool part like where's the cool part where they fight the bad guy like i want to get to that part i don't care about you know i don't care about so and so like i don't care about bulma fighting crabs in the ocean <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't uh you don't want to watch goku learn to drive no i don't <laughs> I mean, it's a funny concept, but I don't want that, you know, don't, don't take, 
don't take that time out of the episode to to show it. Like, you know, maybe like have have one line where somebody goes like, "Oh, you got to go get your license." Oh, you know, and that and that's that's all you need. It's yeah, a, it's a it's a it's a it's a funny joke, but don't make don't use half the episode doing it. Right. So so I guess in short, the the <laughs> advantage of an overarching quest is that the players can feel like what they're doing is accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. However, there's a lot less freedom. They're kind of locked in and they kind of have to do that. Mm-hmm. With a an anthology of different quests, there's a lot more freedom, which can be really, really cool. You can do whatever you want at any given time. However, the downside is it's hard to feel focused. And for the DM, it can be hard to know what you're going to be doing in two sessions. Right. So it's hard to plan. Yeah. Hard to plan what's going to happen. Yeah. Because if you give the character a lot of freedom, it's just like you don't know where they're going to go sometimes. Yeah. And like you might not be prepared for it at all. Uh, next question comes from Mostly Joe through email. And he asks, what non-D&D fantasy games do you enjoy? I've only played a few. Um, so like I, I mentioned before, Mutants and Masterminds. Mm-hmm. Like I played a little bit of that. Yeah. I've played a tiny little bit of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles role-playing game. Awesome. It's called uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. <laughs> is that really? Is that the, that's what, that's that's the, that's the official title. Oh, nice. Um, okay. So w- with, with that one, uh, that was probably my first ever introduction to anything that had to do with role-playing. Okay. Because my, my oldest brother, Tim, mm-hmm. had the book for that, and I found it, and I would, like, flip through the the, the book. It had, like, some, some original... Uh, Ninja Turtle comics in there and yeah. like the the way this game worked it was it was based on the Palladium system I don't know if you're at all familiar with Palladium not much no. it's kind of another another role playing system mm-hmm. I am not sure if it is there is a current version of it but anyway um when you play this game you make a character and then you choose you don't have to be a ninja turtle you can actually be any animal right there's a list of like I don't know 50 or 60 animals in there and then you could probably extrapolate from that to make a unique one. But you you choose an animal. You start off with a certain number of, of points, dependent on which animal you start as. So mm-hmm. like a if you start as like a bull or something, you're probably going to have fewer points because bulls are bigger and stronger than if you started as like a, a, a turtle. Right. Um, you then have a bunch of little categories that you can put these points into, and then you can... You can actually subtract from them too. And the, I don't mean th- these aren't numerical. So like one one example, one category is your appearance. There are three stages to this. The lowest stage, so like uh, I think it was the three stages were like full, partial, and none. So let's say your appearance was none. Mm-hmm. That meant you looked exactly like, say, a bull. Yeah. You, if anybody looked at you, they would see a bull. If you went to partial... So you spent however many points that that animal takes to get to partial. You look kind of like a bull and kind of like a humanoid. Like if you tried to, you could pass yourself off as a humanoid. You, right, with enough like, disguises. Like the Ninja Turtles. Yeah, they wear their trench coats and hats. Yeah, they wear a trench coat and hat. And I guess they look enough like a person that right. they don't get too many looks. In the crowds, in the dark alleyways and crowds of New York, yeah. you know, they can they can pass off. Right. And so then, uh, and then if you go to full, which costs even more points, you look like a person. Mm-hmm. Only someone who really studies you is going to think that, oh, wait a minute. This guy's got like little little horns coming off through his hairline and oh he's got like his nose looks kind of snout like or something. Right, yeah. Um and like for example, if you start as a a monkey, you start at partial appearance. Yeah. Cuz you know, it's a monkey. <laughs> uh and it, aside from appearance, there so was you like you just put a monkey in a suit and you can pass <laughs> I, as a I human. Guess. Give him a typewriter. <laughs> um and then after uh, appearance, there is speech, which mm-hmm. is a similar thing. At none, you have no way to communicate with yeah. anything that is not a similar animal. Yeah, squawks and squeaks. Right. Partial is you can you can basically communicate what you're trying to say through noises and some words. Mm-hmm. And then full is you can talk. Like Ninja Turtles have full speech because they can talk. Right. Then there's hands, which when you have uh, none, you if you're a bull, you just have hooves. Whatever you can do with hooves, you can do with hooves. Yeah. <laughs> Partial, you can like, you take some penalties, but like you can, you can basically 
pick up certain things. You you kind of have hands, kind yeah. of have hooks. So like maybe We're, a little bit more hensile. Yeah. You, again, using the Ninja Trolls examples, they only have three three fingers. Yeah. Like they have a thumb and, and two and two right. fingers, so they can manipulate things in a way. And Donnie can somehow use a t- uh, use a uh, keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's got just really big keys. They just never show them. Sure. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, like, so, but, like, it's that they're not full hands, so they don't have the full dexterity of, yeah, like, yeah. you know, five And so, so then there's full hands, and so you you have, for all intents and purposes, you have hands. Um, if you play as a bird, mm-hmm. I think their hands is tied to their wings. If you have no points in that stat, you just have wings. Whatever mm-hmm. you can do with wings, you can do with wings. Partial is you have like hands on the end of your wings. Right. And then full, you have arms and you have wings. So there's like a picture in this book of this like party of birdmen who are flying with like they have wings and then they have these buff arms in addition to their wings. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh. then I think there was you could like change your size. So like if you started as a really big creature, you could get points back by making yourself smaller. So like a bull, you could play a really small bull. Yeah. In order to get points back. And then like if you're playing like a really playing like a turtle or something, you can pay points to get bigger. Right. And then there is a, you know, you get increases and decreases to your stats based on that. Yeah. Yeah, It's a really neat. Yeah. Character uh, creation system. I remember looking through the book and being like, all right, cool. Yeah. And I just really like Ninja Turtles and turtles in general, honestly. But right. And uh, one of the problems with this system, though, I think is just kind of a a problem inherent to Palladium Mm. is that. Way more things are randomized than should be. Oh, right. Like my friend, uh, Chris, different Chris, uh, he and I were making characters for this. We we're like, Hey, let's, let's actually play this game. Cause I had the book and, you know, let's, let's see what we can do. So when you generate your character, you roll on a chart to determine whether your character is just a natural creature that like just kind of evolved. Or if your character was like created in a lab. And therefore has a different, so like depending on what your origin is, yeah. you start off with different abilities and there's like different feats and skills and such. And isn't there one that's basically much better than all the other ones? Yeah. His, his character was like raised in a lab. My character was like, just kind of, uh, learned to do whatever out in the wild. His character was like head and shoulders better than me in every way. Yeah. It just had way more points like, to deal with. Well, I had a couple skills that he didn't, but he had skills that like could do my skills as a subset. So like his character was, was without a doubt better than mine in every way. And it was all because of the random dice rolls. Yeah. I feel like in a lot of early versions of tabletop systems and stuff, there's a lot of balance issues in it just roles in general, though, especially like with hit points and things like that. I just remember playing second edition and having a like character that was like a fighter had three hit points. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken in first edition, you didn't get to, assign your ability scores as you wanted to you rolled them in order yeah if your if your strength was an 18 sorry you don't get to be a wizard because your first roll was an 18 uh you're gonna be a fighter instead because that you might as well yeah because like otherwise you're just yeah yeah (laughs) so anyway they're 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 all learning i guess so aside from those i've played a few indie games with with my brother because my my brother tim he's my brother, Tim, was really big into indie games, indie RPGs. Gotcha. And I played a few games with him. Um, there was a game we played a couple times. It was called Dogs in the Vineyard, hmm. where you're like uh, a uh, missionary cowboy or something. And okay. like you you assign yourself skills. And then like basically you have a bunch of – you have a big pool of dice. You have like 4D6 and like 3D4 and like I don't know, whatever. And then, and then you say, okay, this D6 is going to be – my ability to drink anybody under the table. Mm-hmm. And then this D8 is going to be, uh, I'm really strong. And then like anytime you have some sort of a conflict that you're like, oh, I'm really strong. So I, that would be helpful in this situation. You add in that D8. Mm-hmm. Then, oh, I'm really, this dry, guy's trying to get me drunk and arm wrestle me. I get to do, I'm really strong and I can drink anybody under the table. Nice. And so, so th- like that was an interesting game. It wasn't really uh, a game that I was huge into just mm-hmm. uh i i prefer games to be a lot more rules heavy yeah assigning different types of uh, different types of dice to different uh, skills and stuff reminds me of there's um shoot i think it's the serenity uh the serenity rpg yeah there, there's a serenity rpg and then there's a i think there's a firefly rpg there's there's Interesting. one there was one that was made 
while the show was out, and then was a, there were, and then I think there was another one that was made after the movie came out. Hmm. And I forget which one it is. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was the one. It was the first one. I just can't remember which one was called what. I'm, I, I think it was. I think that the Firefly RPG was first, and then they made the Serenity one based off of the Serenity movie. I guess <laughs> both titles are based off of the ship. Right. One is the name of the ship. The other is the mm, type of ship. Right. Yeah. One's the model. One's just the name. Like, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, like, uh, but yeah, it had it had a similar thing where like your skills weren't points they were dice and so like you're like somebody who was like incredibly good at a at a at a, at a skill had a, like a d12 and you know somebody who was just kind of okay at it had like a d6 or a d8 yeah and that's kind of neat so that then that's another one that like n- never really played made some characters but never went forward with it but it had some I, I think it had some pretty cool mechanics in there and there was a lot of rules for like um there was a lot of there was a lot of rules for like like travel and things like that in that in that hmm. in that uh, in that game because like you know and like there's a there's a lot of planets and and things in the in the Firefly universe like there's a lot of them yeah um another uh an, another non D and D one I played recently was actually um one of the um what was it it was called a one page yeah like one of those one page RPGs that yeah have gotten kind of popular yeah it's pretty neat though actually there was one, it was called the uh, the Witch is Dead. And you basically play your the group of players play as uh, familiars of a recently deceased witch, and um, this was uh, when I played this it was run by uh, our friend uh, Dave, and mm-hmm. he uh, he basically had us uh, you know you you roll for you roll for your characters you roll like a random animal. Yeah, I I didn't get to take part in this, um, but I, when I saw he posted on Facebook, I was like, I want to be a rat. I want to be the rat. <laughs> which I think I think you rolled randomly for it, and then like you you roll like your 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 animal, which has specific stats. Mm-hmm. I want to say, and there's only like two or three uh, two or three stats. There wasn't really a whole lot, and then a uh, you roll for a random like. M- like a magical ability that they can do something, some sort of spell or ability or something that they can do. And it's usually something very simple and mundane and that's all that they can do. Okay. Um, and so like the idea is like you, you're trying to avenge the witch, you know, they went the avenge the witch and try to uh, like, you know, have her come back to life or something like that. But you're, you know, but you're just, you're, you're just little animals who can each do one individual thing. And it's not always something that's super useful. Like one of them was, they can create food, hmm. and that was like it was a it was a it was a rat that can make food, and <laughs> that's right up my alley. Yeah, right. But I mean, like, but but like when we when he rolled for it, it was like it was like, what am I gonna do with that? I'm like, we'll figure something out. Like, you know, you can you can you know you can lure people with food, that sort of thing. I can't remember what every, what everybody else's character, but mine was a rabbit that could set, uh, that could create fly, fire. Okay. Which, which I mean, like that came in handy more than others, just because it's you know you're creating fire, you can create a distraction, you can you know burn down a church. <laughs> uh, but uh, <clears throat> but it was it was neat, like and there was um, uh, there was some surprising uh, twists and turns in that adventure too. But I won't I won't spoil it because I'm sure I'm sure you can I'm sure you guys can find it on. Oh, because it was. Um... It was like the the one page did include the yeah. adventure. I, yeah, I imagine. Right? Yeah, it was pretty neat. But yeah, that's a, that was a fun one. Again, like yeah, it only it only took a few hours for us to play. You know, it was it was nice. But that's a that's a fun one. That's really cool. Speaking of of witches, right? Actually, um, a similar similar type of RPG actually was created by my brother. Uh, it was called the Mountain Witch. Um, in this game, the idea of it was that each of the players is a disgraced samurai in feudal Japan Mm -hmm. and they were tasked with going to the top of Mount Fuji and slaying Oyanma the mountain witch. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the players would go through and the DM would come up with encounters for them or whatever. It was a pretty simple system. I think like every, every, every time there was a, some sort of like a challenge, one player would roll a D six and then the DM would roll a D six and whoever got higher won. Mm-hmm. And then there's there's other other ways to to get a little bit more in depth than that. But the whole point of the game was that none of the players can trust each other. When you start the game, each player has a dark fate. So there's like a little deck of cards. Each one corresponds to one of these dark fates. Each player is randomly dealt one. Only the player knows which dark fate dark fate they have. Even the DM doesn't know what it is. And the dark fates 
include um, revenge. And what that means is that one of the other party members has wronged you in the past. Mm -hmm. You have to decide whether you're going to take revenge on them or not. Okay. Next one is that um, you have made a pact with the Mountain Witch. Oh. It is up to you as the player to determine the terms and the conditions of that pact. If you keep up your end of the bargain, the Mountain Witch will keep up his. So it might be that you're going to the Mountain Witch to, you know, deliver him a party of of, uh, Ronin. And if you do so, he will grant you amazing riches. If that's the case, the other people in the group might find that out. Right. And they might not be happy about that. Mm -hmm. It might be that um, you... I can't remember what it was called. It's just like you had some sort of ulterior motive that had nothing to do with the Mountain Witch. So you have some sort of a secret reason for going up there that the rest of the party doesn't know about. And there were a couple other ones. But so basically, like each player at the beginning of the game is given a very distinct reason that the rest of the party cannot trust you. And nobody else knows this, but, like, uh, the game was very player narrated. Mm. So, like, you know, the DM would do a little bit. He would say, like, okay, you guys camp for the night. And then he would say, okay, player number one, what do you do? And then it's up to player number one to sort of give a description of what his character does, hopefully involving his dark fate in some way. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, the player um, takes out a... you, You know, you could be pretty, pretty free with your narration. Oh, the player takes out, like... A, a magic leaf whispers into it, the adventurers are on their way, and then tosses it into the sky, and then it floats off. And then, you know, the other players might get an idea of what that means. Mm-hmm. Maybe they wouldn't. You know, right. it's, it's up to them how, what they do with that knowledge. Right. And then, um, so, so, so nobody really knows if they can trust one another. And then one of the mechanics, one of the very few mechanics, like I said, it was, it was pretty, pretty rules light, is that... Each player has like a number of poker chips that they can give to other players. If they do so, so like let's say player number one is is almost about to get killed by uh, Tengu or something. And then player number two does something and kills it and saves him. Player number one can give player number two a poker chip. That is a point of trust. Anytime player number two, so once you get a poker chip from someone else, you can spend it and allow player number one to also roll a d6. Add his D6 to your D6, and then well, yeah. hopefully, you know, you'll get a super high roll and you'll you'll beat the challenge. However, player number two can instead use that point of trust against you. Mm-hmm. If he finds out that, oh my goodness, this is the guy that killed my master, he gave me some points of trust, I'm just going to stab this guy in the back. You can spend those points of trust against another player and give the DM another give, dice well, or did it just No, you just uh you would like you would attack the other player or something and you would roll 2d6 or something and then the other player would only roll one. Okay. And so so the whole point is that nobody knows if they can trust one another. Mhm. They all are trying to achieve this thing, but you know, it's it's all up to to them what happens. When I I've played one full game of this one half game and then I tried to run a game and I, I didn't do a very good job running it. But uh, the, the full game that I played, we got to the end. We got to the Mountain Witch. Uh, I think Jay was playing. Jay's character ended up having to sacrifice himself to kill the Mountain Witch. I think he had made a pact with the Mountain Witch. I don't remember exactly. I think like he had been horribly burned or something as a child. And the Mountain Witch was going to like restore his appearance or something but huh. he like gave up on that instead to let himself die killing the mountain witch so we killed the mountain witch then it was me and jay's now wife meg uh it was the two of us that were left and i i was trying to take revenge because i decided that meg's character like killed my master or something but we killed the mountain witch together and i was like all right you killed my master but i'm willing to overlook that because you know we we fought together we trust each other and so on. Meg's like, okay, so how does this betrayal thing work? <laughs> and then she killed me. Jay's character was dead. She, t- she like became the next mountain witch or something. <laughs> <That's>, so, <laughs> and, and that is, that work? is apparently pretty typical for that type of game. My, my brother was telling me that, uh, when they were doing play tests, like one of the, one of the, the best play tests they did of the party, one character died fighting a monster. Uh huh. One character 
committed seppuku mm-hmm. and then like another character gave up halfway through he was like this is not worth it i'm going home <laughs> i give up the mountain witch can keep doing what he's doing oh, and so uh yeah so it's it's supposed to you know encourage conflict within the party right because that's that's the whole uh, yeah whole that's, theme behind it yeah it definitely seems like yeah that's that's the fun of it is like that is the fun of it of The fun part, I think, is how does this betrayal thing work? (laughs) Like, like you don't just, you don't, like, and you don't just end the game at, okay, we beat the mountain. All right, high five. Yeah. No, no. Like, there's, there's more to be done here. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's not over until it's over. Yeah. So that was, I thought that was really fun. Um, uh, it didn't really, I didn't do a good job running it because, because it's so rules light. I tried running it like I was running a D and D game, and it it was not meant for that. So it uh, right. didn't go so well. Again, not not a fault with the system. That was a fault with me and my own playstyle. Mm. All right. Well, I think that will do it for today. Okay. Uh, if anybody would like to submit items for the Dragon's Horde or submit questions, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail dot com. If you want to see show notes or important links or to download the episode. You can go to interpartyconflict.blogspot.com. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash interpartyconflict or our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash interpartyconflict for discussion and uh, weekly discussion questions from me. You can also find us on Twitter at inpartyconflict. We're also on iTunes and Stitcher. Please rate, review, and subscribe. We really appreciate it. Our intro and outro music is Inspiration by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. Well, good. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. I have been Gabe. And I'm Jeff. And uh, when in doubt, jump on the wheel. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.